Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Ligand Targeted Therapies for Cancer and Autoimmune Diseases. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Roche Molecular Diagnostics. Headquartered in Pleasanton, California, Roche Molecular Diagnostics is a business area of Roche Diagnostics that develops, manufactures, and supplies a wide array of innovative medical diagnostic products, services, tests, platforms, and technologies. With its broad portfolio of oncology, virology, microbiology, and blood screening tests, RMD's clients include researchers, physicians, patients, hospitals, laboratories, and blood banks around the world. The business was founded in the early 1990s following the acquisition of the revolutionary Nobel Prize winning polymerase chain reaction technology. PCR quickly replicates a specific fragment of DNA or RNA to quantities sufficient for accurate laboratory analysis. For more information, please visit lifesciences.roche.com. We have a few announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any problems hearing or seeing this presentation properly, please let us know by clicking on the support button the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This presentation has been approved for continuing educational credits. If you want to obtain your credits, please click on the Get Your Free CME CE Credits button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to a page listing all of our speakers and presentations. Please select the CE CME button under the presentation and follow the instructions to claim your certificate. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Philip Lowe. Dr. Philip Lowe is the director of the Purdue University Center for Drug Discovery and the Ralph C. Corley Distinguished Professor of Chemistry. Dr. Lowe has spent over 39 years exploring novel methods for drug targeting and characterizing the structure, function, and pathologies of the erythrocyte membrane. He has published more than 350 scientific articles and has more than 50 U.S. patents pending. For more information about Dr. Loeb, please click on his name to see his background and experience. I will now turn it over to Dr. Loeb for his presentation. And autoimmune diseases. And we um, take a unique pr approach to trying to achieve the two major objectives that are prescribed by the FDA uh, for any new drug. Um, new drugs need to be both safe and also effective. And the standard method for trying to achieve both safety <clears throat> and efficacy in a drug is to try to build both properties into the same molecule. This is often very difficult as when one optimizes the specificity of a drug for a particular target or pathway, uh, one um, must at the same time change the potency of the drug and sometimes it's very difficult to build both high potency and high specificity into the same molecule. Uh, our approach is to build the safety and the specificity into two different parts of the molecule and that's shown on this uh, slide here where we um, 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 use a targeting ligand that uh, is marked here in yellow. And uh, we'll talk about a number of these that are capable of carrying attached cargoes either to cancer cells or sites of inflammation and autoimmune disease or infectious diseases. And uh, also uh, we uh, then build a second part, the uh, potency, up into the payload shown in the upper left-hand uh, corner there. Uh, the payload then can be a therapeutic agent for treatment of a disease. It can be an imaging agent for 
monitoring progress to therapy, for identifying patients, for um, aid and surgery, as I'll describe in just a moment. And then as part of this same uh, um, conjugate, we also use a spacer or linker connecting the targeting ligand to the payload. And this spacer or linker can be used to optimize the PK, the PD of the drug to uh, also build in uh, multiple drugs into the same um, conjugate and uh, exploit other opportunities similar to this. Um, I'm going to begin by uh, using our first targeting ligand that we developed, folic acid, as an example and take you through a few of the interesting applications of this, both in delivering therapeutic and imaging agents. Um, folic acid, as you can see here, uh, is taken into cells by three different routes. On the left-hand side, uh, we find that uh, there are two transporters that carry in the vitamin. One is the reduced folate carrier, the reduced folate carrier is found in virtually all cells of the body. The, another is a proton coupled folate transporter. It is also found in virtually all cells of the body. Uh, these have lower affinity for the vitamin in the neighborhood of uh, 10 to the minus fifth molar. A third pathway for uptake of this vitamin is a folate receptor. Uh, this a receptor is very rarely expressed as I'll show in uh, the next slide. And, uh, this, um, uh, this expression is primarily limited to cells that uh, want to take up the vitamin when there's very little vitamin available. As a consequence, the binding constant is, a neighbor, is in the neighborhood of 10 to the minus 10th molar. Now the important uh, application of this information for the seminar today is that the reduced folate carrier and proton coupled uh, folate transporters are found uh, throughout the body in all normal cells and it's the receptor is primarily found on malignant cells and also uh, activated macrophages. Um, and I'll describe these, uh, the applications of this unique expression pattern in a moment. Um, this uh, slide, is, I don't see the video running, it's supposed to show receptor mediated endocytosis of the um, uh, of the of a folate linked rhodamine conjugate, where the arrow points, if the uh, movie were operative, uh, it would show um, endocytosis of a folate rhodamine conjugate as it invaginates at the cell surface and enters the cell. Um, cancer cells take in that have folate receptors. Uh, are, uh, take in folate conjugates by receptor-mediated endocytosis um, very rapidly. The internalization process takes just a few minutes and the receptor eventually recycles back to the cell surface for more vitamin. Um, folate conjugates enter by the same pathway. Um, uh, activated macrophages that also express folate receptors actually uh, take the conjugates in also very rapidly, but the recycling rate is much faster, only in a few minutes. Uh, is requ are required before the receptor returns to the cell surface. Um, following entry into the cell, the folate conjugates traffic through a variety of endosomes, and these endosomes are generally reducing in nature, and so disulfide bonds built into the drug molecules, as you can see the, the drug uh, mimic up above, uh, contains a disulfide bond. Uh, these disulfide bonds are reduced uh, or cleaved upon entry into the cells, but they're generally quite stable during circulation. And because our folate conjugates reach their sites of action in tumors or in, in inflamed tissues within five minutes and saturate the receptors within the same amount of time, the disulfide bond turns out to be sufficiently stable in circulation that we don't see much drug release, but following endocytosis into the target cell, the reducing environment releases the drug. You can see in this particular image, the um, um, uh, red spots in the center show that the released rhodamine that's connected to folate by the disulfide bond um, um, uh, is trapped in endosomes. If this rhodamine were membrane permeable, it would diffuse out of these endosomes and enter the cell. 
Um, where are folate receptors accessible to parenterally administered folate conjugates? Uh, it turns out that uh, cancer, a number of cancer tissues, but not all cancer tissues, overexpress a folate receptor. It's fi primarily found in cancers of the ovary, lung, breast, kidney, endometrial, colon, and hematopoietic cancers. As I mentioned earlier, also activated macrophages have accessible folate receptors. Activated monocytes do also. But uh, curiously, uh, resting or quiescent macrophages and monocytes do not express a folate receptor. So this receptor is uniquely found on only the inflamed uh, subpopulation of these uh, myelocytic cells. Then finally, as we'll point out in a moment, the uh, folate receptor is expressed and accessible on the apical surface of the proximal tub tubule cells of the kidney. And, uh, uh, I won't go into this any further, but I will mention at this point that we have uh, tested a number of very toxic folate link uh, drugs in both preclinical and, and in human clinical trials. And uh, we do not find that any of them cause any toxicity to the kidneys. And the reason why it emerged in a study that we did a few years ago where we followed the itinerary of these folate conjugates in kidneys and live mice and we find that although the receptor mediates uptake of the folate conjugate by the kidney, it also mediates transcytosis of the folate conjugate across the kidney where it's released back into the bloodstream. So it turns out to really be a salvage receptor to keep uh, the patient from going folate deficient. So it captures the folate in the urine and puts it back into the bloodstream to keep you from losing the vitamin that you need. As a consequence, the kidney doesn't retain it, nor is it, uh, nor is it damaged by folate conjugates. Um, this bar graph shows the uh, expression level, as these are our, some of our latest data, on folate receptor in different cancers. You can see that uh, ovarian cancer, over 80% of ovarian cancers express the folate receptor. About 80% of non-small cell lung cancers, maybe uh, three quarters of kidney cancers. Large number of endometrial, colorectal, and breast. But then at the same time, you'll notice that there are quite a number of very important cancers like brain cancers, prostate cancers, pancreatic cancers, and so forth that do not express uh, significant levels of folate receptor. And because of that, as we'll talk about in a moment, it is important to be able to, to design targeting ligands that will carry attached uh, therapeutic and imaging agents to these other cancers also. And we have uh, undertaken this task uh, in, a, in addition to the, using folate. Um, this slide here shows the um, the uh, a distribution of folate receptors by imaging. And on, on the left-hand side is a healthy patient. And in this healthy patient, you can see in the whole body scan uptake only in the kidneys. And if you remember a moment ago, I told you there were three sites where folate uh, receptors were overexpressed. One was in cancer tissues. Well, this healthy individual doesn't have cancer, so we wouldn't see any uptake there. Uh, second was in activated macrophages and active activated monocytes, but not in resting um, hematopoietic cells of any sort. Uh, and so uh, because there's no inflammation in this individual, we don't see uptake at any other sites associated with inflammation. And then finally, we mentioned that there was uptake in the, uh, uh, there were folate receptors on the apical surfaces of the proximal tubule cells, and that leads to uptake in the kidneys. And as I said, that will eventually disappear as it moves the uh, folate, folate conjugate or the vitamin back into the bloodstream. On the right-hand side of this uh, paired image, you'll see um, a patient with stage three ovarian cancer. You can see the malignant disease throughout the peritoneal cavity. Over on the right in the insert, you see the breast cancer metastasized to the brain. Look below that, you'll see a primary brain tumor and so forth. So in patients that um, uh, don't have cancer or inflammatory disease, you see just the kidneys and other patients, you'll see whatever, either the inflamed, inflammatory disease or the um, um, malignant disease. Um, so this imaging we think is very important, as you'll see in this cartoon, um, uh, a uh, incorrect diagnosis of the real problem can lead to an incorrect uh, 
a therapy for that problem. Here, uh, the therapy that's being prescribed is a mild sedative for anxiety and Vicodin for the back pain. And obviously, that's not the solution to the problem. So uh, better diagnostics can significantly assist in, uh, better th in, in designing better therapies. Um, one of the diagnostics that we have designed is uh, the use of these targeting ligands to deliver attached fluorescent light bulbs very selectively to tumor tissues. And this allows us to light up tumors with a bright fluorescent uh, signal. And using a fluorescent, uh, micro, uh, fluorescent camera, this can enable the surgeon to locate and resect malignant disease much more efficiently and accurately than was previously possible. Uh, we can also use this same structure for uh, delivery of photodynamic therapy agents and a few other applications. This can be used, as I mentioned above, uh, when, with any targeting ligand. And I'll give you a few examples of this now in the next few uh, slides. This particular movie here actually is a video of the um, provided by Go Van Dam and Vasilis Zias Christos at the University of Groningen in Munich. Um, and what it shows is the first, as far as we know, uh, page, uh, surgery performed on this planet using a tumor targeted fluorescent dye. And in this case, the patient was injected about two hours before surgery with folate linked to fluorescein. That's shown on the left, it's not very bright there. Uh, and um, the folate fluorescein, of course, um, perfuses throughout the body and is captured by cancer cells. At this point in the surgery, the surgeons, Dr. Van Dam believes he's removed most of the, uh, virtually all of the cancer that he can see with the naked eye. And now you can see, looking at the omentum of this cancer patient, they're looking around to see if there's any additional disease and they can't find it until they turn on the fluorescent lamp. Here they see all these fluorescent lesions. But at this point in the surgery, they don't know uh, if these fluorescent spots are indeed malignant or not. And so Dr. Van Dam uh, has the technician take these with her forceps and run to the pathologist next door, who then looks and evaluates whether those fluorescent lesions are indeed uh, malignant or not. And it turned out from these surgeries and subsequent ones performed by uh, this group in Leiden, uh, excuse me, in Groningen, that uh, essentially all of the um, uh, fluorescent lesions were uh, malignant, and they found, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, and uh, with the citation where the data are published, that uh, uh, they were able to remove approximately five times more malignant uh, lesions with the aid of fluorescence than by standard methods in uh, uh, following a, a group of, I think, eight surgeries. Um, this uh, 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 next slide shows that, in fact, uh, even very small lesions can be revealed uh, by this method. Uh, at the University of Leiden Medical Center, Dr. Uh, Varmeyer and uh, Tumors and Hoopstons uh, have been doing similar work. And you can see in this stain the folate receptor positive tumor cells in this section. And you'll notice over on, uh, on the uh, right-hand side, where the fluorescent uh, folate fluorescein accumulated following intravenous injection in, in the arm, uh, even though this uh, comes from an ovarian cancer patient and the lesions obviously from the peritoneal cavity. And you'll see that every spot seen in the center panel is fluorescent in the right-hand panel, suggesting even in that lesion up, up in the upper left-hand corner of the panel, there are only about four or five cells there uh, that even very few cells can be targeted and illuminated by this method. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide here. And these data were provided by Dr. Sunil Singhal at the University of Pennsylvania, who has done quite a number of these surgeries on lung cancer patients. And you can see on the left-hand side the um, image uh, that is visualized by the surgeon. If you turn on the fluorescent lamp, you see the one on the right-hand side. The major lesion there in the center uh, that's fluorescent uh, was, re was in fact seen in the CT scan. The smaller one on the lower right was not. And of course, this changes the whole um, um, diagnosis, staging, and so forth of the patient. And it also um, 
alters the surgery. Of course, this allows the surgeon to remove these extra lesions that were not seen and would not have been seen without fluorescence. Um, more recently, because fluorescein is not visible very uh, for more than a half a millimeter in uh, tissue, we've gone and made similar uh, folate targeted uh, near infrared dyes that are uh, fluorescent in the near infrared range where light is more permeable or penetrating to, uh, tissue. And the structure shown here on the left, on the right, uh, the comparison of the green versus the red curve shows that the the, uh, the folate linked near infrared dye binds with the same affinity as free folic acid, so we haven't lost any, any affinity for folate receptors on cancer cells. And here is a, a surgery that was performed by uh, the same group at the University of uh, Leiden University Medical S Center. Um, and uh, the, the fluorescence is very diffuse there, as you can see. It looks very um, spread out. And as a consequence, that indicated that there may be a fluorescent lesion deep in the tissue and that the light is being scattered as it is uh, as it comes out of uh, the tissue. And eventually, of course, digging down, they found this fluorescent lesion, which turned out to be malignant, which would have never been seen by any other method. This next uh, um, um, image just shows the comparison on the lower right with uh, seen by a surgeon using all of today's standard methods versus the uh, image on the upper left, which is an image revealing what the surgeon sees with these new tumor targeted fluorescent dyes that uh, are or accumulate only in malignant tissue and reveal wherever uh, malignant disease is located. You can see when they see that fluorescent signal, then they can go in and feel it with uh, their uh, finger to see if it, uh, if, if it demonstrates the uh, altered uh, um, tactile uh, sensations that are associated with a more rigid tumor. And as you can see, then if they are, they feel comfortable about it, they can go ahead and uh, pull it out and resect And This, of course, turned out to be cancer. We have a lot of other movies like this, but I'll just jump to a few of the bottom lines, and that is uh, very small lymph nodes, as you can see up in the upper right and, and lower right, uh, can be revealed even when they're buried using these near-infrared dyes. And we believe in the long term, this can save a lot of lives by allowing the surgeon to find all of the, um, or most of the malignant disease that may have otherwise been um, uh, uh, missed. Um, moving on, we recognizing that this is a new technology that could revolutionize uh, surgery in the future by allowing all malignant disease to be quickly located and resected. We have gone on and linked uh, um, our near-infrared dye up to a number of other targeting ligands in this particular animal model. Um, we made a targeting ligand for prostate-specific membrane antigen. Uh, this uh, uh, will allow imaging prostate cancer. Uh, we have another one that targets cholecystokine and 2 receptor. This images some GI tract cancers. We've got uh, still a, a, uh, another one that images neurokinin-1 receptor. This targets a number of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, I could go on and on and on, but we have quite a few. We're trying to select the right um, collection of these to put into a cocktail that we believe will be effective for imaging uh, virtually all cancers. In addition to, uh, to helping the surgeon find cancer tissue, we've also undertaken to help the surgeon avoid accidentally cutting important healthy tissues. In this particular image, I challenge you to uh, uh, locate uh, the, um, the ureter. And you can see what looks like a number of different tubes on the left, up, going up the left-hand side, and then a little bit more to the right, going straight up and down, and even more than that. But if you really want to know, you can use a ureter-targeted dye. And uh, when you look, you see it, the ureter is actually way over on the right. And uh, uh, this is important because um, there are over a half a million surgeries for endometriosis a year in the United States. and um, uh, uh, clipping the ureter can, can occur. Uh, it's not uncommon during those surgeries. Also during colon cancer surgeries, uh, 
you know, there's a, a, it's often a mistakenly clipped uh, because it's very, very hard to see. Another, uh, another um, potential application of this, of course, targeting nerves and, uh, you know, avoidance of cutting nerves can be very important in a number of surgeries. For example, in prostate cancer surgery, if the ner nerve that innervates the prostate gland is cut, then the patient is often incontinent and or um, impotent, and that's, uh, that's important to avoid. Um, so this slide just lists a number of the uh, possible uses of um, this, uh, these tumor-targeted fluorescent dyes. we found we can use them to quantitate circulating tumor cells. We can uh, localize and resect, the surgeons can localize and resect more uh, malignant disease, as I showed you. Elimination of positive margins on the tumors is very important so that there's no residual disease left in the patient. We, th these uh, tools can also be used for pre-surgical endoscopic diagnosis of the stage of the cancer and assessing whether surgery is even, in, uh, even called for in particular cases. If, it's, if the cancer is spread widely, then often the surgeon will decide not to operate, but just turn the patient over for um, chemotherapy. Assessment of disease recurrence, it's, uh, for example, in ovarian cancer, um, a patient goes through surgery, is then placed on chemotherapy, and shortly afterwards, um, uh, uh, then, then the patient is placed on chemotherapy, and then there's a waiting period. And if recurrence does occur, it's only seen usually about 13 months later. If there were a way of assessing that recurrence much earlier, I think a lot more lives could be saved. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, identification of metastatic lymph nodes is important and avoiding damage to healthy tissues. So there's a lot of potential for this. Um, let's talk a little bit about killing tumors by targeting them with the same targeting ligands I just mentioned. I'll give one example on this. <clears throat> this is the structure of a drug that Endocide, uh, a company that I founded, um, has taken into clinical trials. It's in phase three. Um, you can see here. The structure involves on the left folic acid in black linked via the spacer in blue to a cleavable bond, that disulfide I spoke about earlier in green. And then the, the warhead is this um, vinca alkaloid that is about a thousand times more potent than venblastine. It's a modified version of that. Uh, it was taken into animal studies, and we can see that. Uh, it, uh, Regardless of how large the tumors are, even up to 800 cubic millimeters, as soon as they're treated, the tumors disappear. The real question was, though, with this very potent drug, which was very toxic and dropped immediately from clinical trials uh, due to toxicity in its non-targeted form, that is, when it was just administered without a targeting ligand, the real question that we wanted to answer immediately was, what happens when we target it? Do we still suffer from this? Uh, uh, un, intolerable um, toxicity. And you can see after the first 100 patients were uh, t examined with this folate targeted version, there were absolutely no grade four toxicities. There were very few grade three toxicities, and those were limited to constipation and the associated abdominal pain, which um, um, can could be treated with an over-the-counter laxative. This, this here, these are the results of the study with just a single agent uh, administered by itself. But anyway, the uh, the uh, prediction that targeting the drug would reduce off-target toxicity was fulfilled and demonstrated in this study. Um, just to illustrate this further, we saw no new absolutely zero neutropenia, no bone marrow suppression, even though the naked drug or something very similar to it shows that in virtually half of the patients. Um, the drugs also, uh, the uh, folate's also used to select patients. In this top example of a CT scan on the left and then a folate targeted imaging agent, well, that's a technetium based imaging agent linked to folic acid, you can see two, the two lesions very clearly. And in that case, uh, this would indicate that the malignant lesions have folate receptors, and so if we can target a folate-linked imaging agent, we should be able to target a folate-linked uh, therapeutic agent, and we go ahead and treat that patient. In this example below, the malignant lesions circled in yellow do not show up in the folate scan in the middle, and so the conclusion there is not to treat. 
And we've followed through with this, and this just shows um, what uh, happens in, and why this pre-selection of patients with the imaging agent is so important. Here is a study with our, that folate vinca alkaloid only as a single agent, no accompanying cytotoxic drug. And we just looked at uh, the, the survival of patients where 100% of the lesions, that's the top uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, where 100% of the lesions express the folate receptor. Uh, and when they're treated with a folate receptor targeted drug, they do very well. In the middle uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, plot there, um, somewhere between 10 and 90% of the lesions in, in, in the patients were folate receptor positive and they did not do as well. And then in patients where none of the lesions are folate receptor positive, they did even, even worse. This just uh, demonstrates the importance of using an imaging agent for selecting patients for therapy. This is also confirmed in uh, studies of non-small cell lung cancer patients. Again, those with higher percentages of folate receptor expression did much better in both overall survival and, and progression-free survival. Whoops, um, I don't know what happened there. Um, I, I need some help. I, um, I'm not sure what happened. Let me see. Okay. Um, it looks like I have control over things again, although I can't uh, see a lot of what I used to see. Um, these are data on non-small cell lung cancer patients using the same drug where we're comparing the uh, standard of care, which is docetaxel alone, versus docetaxel plus the uh, folate-targeted vinca alkaloid called EC145. And you can see just from the Kaplan-Meier curve that the combination therapy uh, led to a uh, median overall survival of 12.5 months, whereas the standard of care, docetaxel, uh, led only to 6.6 .6 months. Um, more recently, we have replaced the uh, folate-targeted vinca alkaloid with a folate-targeted tubulysin. And looking at these four graphs here, the folate-targeted uh, tubulysin B is in blue, and you can see that in all of these different uh, tumor xenograft models, the um, folate-targeted tubulysin is much more potent than the folate-targeted vinca alkaloid. It actually performs better for two reasons. Uh, number one, it's fundamentally much more potent as a basic drug. And number two, uh, as you can see here on the right, in uh, tumor uh, cells or in tumor uh, xenografts that have been selected for their high expression of P-glycoprotein or drug-resistant pumps, the uh, folate-targeted tubulysin is a much poorer substrate of these pumps than many other drugs, and so it's resistant to these uh, efflux pumps. And so that, in addition to its higher potency, its reduced uh, susceptibility to efflux pumping makes it a better drug. This is now in phase one clinical trials, and it's uh, just in the dose escalation stage. Uh, what about folate negative cancers? Um, this is the uh, crystal structure of prostate-specific membrane antigen. When this crystal structure came out, we immediately designed a small molecule to fit into the bottom of that pocket that you see. That pocket's about 20 angstroms deep. It makes great raw material for structure-based drug design. Uh, this is a cutaway view of that pocket, and on the left-hand side, you can see the drug uh, sitting deep in the pocket, and there's, there's a spacer. We have uh, some additions onto that spacer to improve overall affinity. And then on the right, you can see the um, therapeutic warhead or imaging agent. And uh, we have used this to image cancer patients. Here is a comparison uh, of the same patient at uh, the same time scanned with a bone scan on, uh, or actually consecutively, with a bone scan on the right. The bone scan is uh, uh, designed to um, pick up raw bone where the cancer, which often metastasizes to the bone, has eaten through an exposed raw hydroxyapatite. And you can see lesions in the upper left-hand sh shoulder there and in the ribs and so forth. On the left-hand side, 
is the image with the, uh, the PSMA targeted imaging agent that we designed. You can see the same lesions uh, that you see on the right, but uh, many additional lesions. And these additional lesions are due to malignant disease that is not yet eaten through and exposed to the raw hydroxyapatite. This turns out to be uh, very important, especially in cases as you see right here, um, where you can see the prostate gland, which is malignant. That's shown, po pointed at by the arrows there but also a metastatic lymph node, which would never be revealed by the bone scan because there's no bone there. And so by being able to image soft malignant tissue, this is very important. Of course, we can use this also to deliver therapeutic drugs. This structure shows the, the uh, structure of folate, uh, excuse me, this DUPA, as we call it, targeted tubulizing conjugate and down below are the data on tumor growth in animal models. The green curve shows that when we dose these animals after their tumors reach roughly 400 cubic millimeters, they immediately disappear. Uh, this uh, uh, DUPA conjugate is also in phase one clinical trials right now. Sumit Kularatni, a graduate student in my lab, designed this. Um, we have, tar as I mentioned earlier, targeting, uh, targeting ligand that targets cholecystokinin-2 receptor. These are the cancers that uh, can overexpress it. You can see here the binding constant and uh, its competition. Uh, and the image there shows the uptake very selectively in the tumor. Um, in this slide, we can see the, tar the structure of the, of the um, Therapeutic conjugate of the same targeting ligand. Uh, this also leads to uh, good tumor uh, control uh, without any weight loss. As you can look at the weight loss curve on the right and the tumor control is on uh, the left. Um, the neurokinin-1 receptor ligand's also been used for therapeutic applications. So this is an imaging agent uh, on the left. On the right is competition. Uh, and when we add a competitive ligand to block receptors, we see no uptake in the tumor. Uh, the structure of the uh, targeted therapeutic agent, which is a tubulizin conjugate, is shown uh, on the top there. And again, we get uh, good tumor control without any weight loss with this conjugate. Um, uh, we have a number of other uh, ligands under development for tumor targeting in our lab, and this just shows a list of some of the tumors that we have ligands uh, for that we're developing right now for clinical translation. Um, I just spend just a couple of seconds on um, our use of these uh, other targeting ligands for addressing infectious diseases, the same general concept of using a targeting ligand to deliver an attached imaging or therapeutic agent specifically to sites of infection uh, is also valid. This is an image of some mice where we placed some uh, H1N1 virus, three microliters on the nose of the mouse and then waited three days uh, on the left and then injected in the tail vein a ligand that targets the uh, virus infected cells on the right. Um, is a control mouse injected with the same imaging agent, and it's a, a technetium-99 imaging agent. And you can see that we get targeting to the infected cells in the lung. Um, more re recently, we've uh, been working on a drug for treating malaria. We're actually starting clinical trials on this. The uh, anti-malarial agent um, um, blocks the egress or the um, escape of the uh, malaria parasite from the red blood cell by inhibiting a red blood cell enzyme that the parasite has, has to activate in order to get out of the cell. And by blocking this red cell enzyme rather than targeting a plasmodium falciparum enzyme, we believe that we can prevent any mutation uh, generated resistance because the um, parasite can't mutate the human genome and uh, it, uh, relies on this enzyme to get out. And so by blocking it, we can trap it. Uh, we're uh, starting cl clinical trials. We've done preclinical work in Vietnam. We're starting clinical trials very soon in both Vietnam and Africa. 
Uh, finally, uh, for the last uh, few moments of my talk, I'd like to just address the um, um, uh, application of this technology for treating autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. Uh, briefly, um, uh, while imaging cancer patients with our folate targeted radio imaging agent, EC20, um, and we've imaged probably over a thousand of these patients by now, we noticed in a few of them uh, some uptake of the folate targeted drug in the knee or in the shoulder, and we knew that a patient does not get cancer of the knee very often, so we wondered what might be happening here. To make a long story short, we obtained some synovial fluid from one of these patients and uh, looked to see what cells in the synovial fluid might have folate receptors, and we found that activated macrophages expressed folate receptors. Uh, further pursuit of this uh, research area revealed that resting macrophages do not express folate receptors, nor do T cells, B cells, mast cells, eosinophils, basophils, and so on and so forth. It's a unique property of, of the very activated subset of monocytes and macrophages. And because these are found in virtually all malignant, all, excuse me, all inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, this uh, uh, gave us a wonderful agent for targeting infl inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. I'll just show you a few stains using a monoclonal antibody to folate receptor beta. It's a beta isoform. Uh, and these are human tissues. These data were obtained at Mayo Clinic here on rheumatoid arthritis. The brown stain shows the expression of folate receptor on these activated macrophages. That, uh, that was uh, the Previous slide was rheumatoid arthritis. This is ulcerative colitis. You can see a lot of brown spots. Those are collections of macrophages. This is scleroderma. Again, it's characterized by accumulation of folate receptor beta positive macrophages. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is an, uh, characterized by accumulation of these um, um, anti-inflammatory or alternatively activated macrophages, but still they have folate receptors, whereas resting macrophages do not. Uh, Steve Oliver at NYU at the time, he's now at Novartis, stains uh, psoriatic tissue for us. In the upper right-hand corner, you see the green spots reveal where macrophages are located in the psoriatic lesions. In the upper left, you can see the stain for folate receptor beta virtually 100% of the macrophages there in the, in the inflamed tissue is are express folate receptors. On the lower left, you see where cells are located, and you can see, uh, based on the Herx dye, which stay nuclei, and you can see, again, the blue spots in the upper left-hand corner reveal that there are skin cells there, but the skin, that part of the skin is normal. It's not psoriatic, so it doesn't have any macrophages or any um, folate receptors. Um, so imaging of autoimmune diseases, we can also use the imaging agent for those. These are images of uh, rheumatoid arthritic hands. These were done at Mayo Clinic by Eric Madison. Here, uh, Virginia Krauss at Duke University looked at osteoarthritic joints, and they, re we, they reveal exactly the sites where active inflammation is occurring. Here is some Sjogren's syndrome. Um, we, can, we can see atherosclerotic lesions. This would, uh, published on this a number of times. Um, and we can see a, a ischemic tissue where the macrophages accumulate after the ischemia. In this case, it's ischemic colitis. Just to make a long story short, we've looked at all of these diseases on this list, and all of them are characterized by a significant accumulation of these activated folate receptor positive macrophages. This, is allow this allows for both imaging and treatment of these diseases. Um, let me just talk about a therapy for them briefly. Uh, um, we've looked at uh, the use of a folate targeted aminopterin. Aminopterin is a, a precursor of methotrexate. It's more potent than methotrexate by quite a bit, but it's also more toxic. And so we selected it because we don't worry about the toxicity because we have um, uh, control over where it uh, goes. And by targeting it to the activated macrophages, we don't have to worry about the toxicity. Here we see EC, uh, seven, uh, uh, EC um, 746, which is the folate aminopterin conjugate. Uh, it leads to 
significant control of the rheumatoid arthritis in this uh, adjuvant-induced arthritis model in rats. And uh, if we block the receptor, where the, the line showing EC746 plus competitors, where we add an excess of folic acid to block the uh, receptor, we see no efficacy. So it really is receptor mediated. On the right is a comparison with methotrexate. It's not as good at, uh, as the uh, targeted aminopterin. Co competition doesn't work very well either. Um, we can also look at um, um, uh, uh, experimental autoimmune uveitis. This is an inflammation in the eye. And just to make a long story short, the uh, result is the same. These are data from June Liu's group at Endocyte. Um, and uh, she can, she sees that 746 uh, prevents the uveitis, and uh, you can block that therapeutic benefit by ex adding excess folic acid. And the histology will demonstrate that on the left. We've also looked at a, a model of multiple sclerosis. It's called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. In this case, the animal is vaccinated against myelin basic protein, and they develop uh, an immune response to their uh, the brain. And um, these animals um, uh, become immobilized. They can't move their legs and so forth. And if you treat them with the the folate targeted aminopterin, they recover and can run around the cage. This again shows some data on that. Uh, it's the same data as you've seen before, so I won't repeat it. And finally, uh, experimental folate targeted therapy for experimental inflammatory bowel disease. This is a, uh, these studies were done in IL-10 knockout mice. They developed a, a ulcerative colitis as seen in the images there on the left. Um, and this colitis can be greatly uh, uh, prevented by, um, in this genetic model, by just treatment with the uh, EC746, the folate targeted aminopterin. Um, my final uh, topic I'd like to bring up, I think it's one that is very important for drug companies interested in. Um, uh, conducting a clinical trial for any one of the mentioned autoimmune or inflammatory diseases. We've found that using a folate targeted imaging agent, we can actually predict the outcome of any therapy long before the um, uh, clinical uh, uh, manifestations uh, um, show themselves. And this is an example here in this slide. We have induced rheumatoid arthritis, collagen-induced arthritis in these mice. And three days after um, in, in, induction of the arthritis, we imaged with the folate-targeted imaging agent. And the animal treated with methotrexate on the left shows no uptake in their, in their inflamed feet, the arthritic feet. The animal treated with dexamethasone on the right shows no uptake of the folate-targeted imaging agent. The animal in the center that wasn't treated shows significant uptake. That's just due to the accumulation of activated macrophages. If you look on this slide in the upper left-hand corner, the um, uh, clinical score at this time and down below the paw thickness score at that time shows absolutely no difference between the treated and untreated animals. That is physically looking at at swelling of the paw, redness, and all of the different parameters associated with scoring uh, the rheumatoid arthritis, they're indistinguishable. But if you follow those same animals later on, uh, uh, by day 11, there are enormous differences between them. Yet that was not visible at day three when the imaging agent revealed it. Now this, is, this suggests that you might be able to use a folate targeted uh, imaging agent to predict long before physical symptoms emerge whether your drug is working or not. So, you know, just to see if this might apply to other drugs, we looked at some biologics with the same question in mind. We looked at Ambrol and Arencia in the mouse model. And after three days, both of them also knocked down the um, inflammation in the feet uh, as, as indicated by this folate-targeted radioimaging agent. The disease controls, again, shown in the center, and it doesn't show anything. And again, if you look at the plots uh, in this paper that, that I think just appeared online, this is ju has just appeared online, you can read about it, um, 
there's no indication at this early time point, even, even though later these biologics both had an effect on, uh, had benefit in treating the autoimmune disease. Um, we go on, uh, we decided to look and see, well, <clears throat> maybe everything shows up. So <clears throat> we looked at a drug that these, uh, that collagen-induced arthritis a uh, uh, animals do not respond to, and, and that's naproxen. And indeed, we didn't see a response, and the clinical data re uh, confirmed that. Then finally, uh, we, de well, we decided after that, we'd go to a number of different autoimmune and inflammatory diseases to see if it it were the case, and this is another one, ulcerative colitis, and you can see the healthy animal on the left, no uptake. The diseased animal in our uh, ulcerative colitis model shows significant uptake, and then when we treat that with just standard drugs for treating ulcerative colitis, cimetidine and sulfasalazine, we saw uh, at four days, right after starting the treatment, significant uh, reduction in uptake of the imaging agent, even though when you look at the clinical score, at this time point, you can't see a difference. So again, um, we pick up and can predict the outcome long before it's, it's uh, evident in the um, uh, uh, clinical examination. The same thing applies, I'll just move quickly since the time's running out, for a pulmonary fibrosis, which is a uh, disease characterized by anti-inflammatory or M2-like macrophages. And again, the standard therapies there work and the results can predict it. Then we thought it might be very important finally in these, uh, for use in predicting outcome when the clinical outcome would not be evident for months and months and months. And this would be in uh, treatments for heart disease to look at the buildup of, for example, atherosclerosis. And this is, we looked at on the right, valsartan, rosaglitazone, ramipril, rosetia, flubastin, and so forth. And all of them showed what we see under treatment very early, a very significant effect long before the clinical uh, uh, differences were manifested. So um, uh, just concluding, I think there's some, um, Oh, I forgot, I put in just a little bit here on why not use large antibodies for all of this. It just turns out that um, um, I'll just skip to the point um, that antibodies penetrate uh, tissues very, very slowly. It takes several days for them to reach their sites, whereas uh, small molecules, here's a, here's a good curve showing in the same animal, in the same tumor, the penetration of a a folate peg rhodamine conjugate, so it's folic acid targeting rhodamine, but there's a large peg in between, and those are the first few dots through the first 60 minutes there. And then at 60 minutes in the same animal, we add folate rhodamine with no peg in it, and immediately the tumor saturates. The uh, larger molecule simply doesn't penetrate very fast, and we find that to be a, a big advantage for imaging. So. Here are my conclusions. Uh, good drugs that go to the wrong cells cause, cause toxicity, so targeting can overcome that. Nonspecific drugs can be targeted to pathologic cells with low molecular weight homing ligands of the sort that we've designed. Responding patients can be selected with an imaging agent targeted with the same uh, ligand. Uh, targeting or homing ligands can be found for many diseases. I showed you cancer, I showed you infectious diseases, I showed autoimmune inflammatory diseases. And then ad additional applications can be found for these targeting ligands. And I spent a lot of time on the fluorescence guided surgery, but there are a lot of others. Here's my lab, the group that uh, has done all the work. Uh, and I give them all the credit because all I did was uh, sit in the office and uh, answer questions. <laughs> and then here are the names of a lot of people I need to give credit to. They uh, at other institutions that have been very instrumental in the success of this project. So thank you very much for uh, your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. And I have a, a, I'm not sure where to get to this questions because do I click on the question and answer? Thank you, Dr. Lowe, for that informative presentation. Our audience can submit their questions by clicking on the Q&A button, which can be found at the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to get to as many as we can. We do have one question already. If any tissue which is normal but has more folate receptor, how can we know that it is normal? 
Um, well, I think we have to rely on the fact that um, most of the uh, normal tissues that express folate receptor express this receptor in an inaccessible location where it wouldn't be uh, imaged with a folate a targeted imaging agent that is injected in the vein for, let me give an example of this. There are folate receptors on the apical surface of alveolar epithelial cells in the lung. These receptors are only on the surface of the cell facing the air sacs. So unless your blood bleeds into the air sacs, your folate linked imaging agent will not access those receptors and will not bind to them. So as you saw in the image at the beginning, a healthy individual that has neither cancer nor an autoimmune or inflammatory disease uh, should show uptake only in the uh, kidneys. In this particular case, the folate receptor is also expressed on the apical surface of an epithelial cell, but because folates are small enough to filter in the ur into the urine or into the filtrate, they can access this receptor on the apical surface, which is the surface facing the uh, urine. And so because of that, that is one ap uh, epithelial surface that has folate receptors that can be accessed. Uh, there are very few others. They're only in the lungs, and then there's one in the choroid plexus of the brain that's on the wrong side of the blood-brain barrier. But other than that, we shouldn't see any uptake. So if you see uptake, it should be at a site other than the kidneys. It should be cancer or an autoimmune or inflammatory lesion. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, we do have another question. Is the folate receptor always targeted or can some other receptors be targeted as well? Um, with folate, we only see uh, the folate receptor targeted. Now there are folate receptors, different isoforms. One is folate receptor alpha and that's the one that's expressed on cancer cells and on a few of these epithelial cells. And I mentioned folate receptor beta that's expressed on activated macrophages, but not resting macrophages or other cells. There uh, is also a folate receptor delta uh, that's expressed on the ovum, the egg, and it's also expressed on um, uh, regulatory T cells, but it doesn't bind folic acid with any, with physiologic affinity at the binding constant is three orders of magnitude weaker than the others, the binding constant for alpha and beta, so we don't target it. It just doesn't have a high enough affinity. And we never see folate receptor gamma, so. Um, uh, then we use other ligands, as I mentioned, to target other receptors. We use uh, DUPA to target the prostate-specific membrane antigen receptor and so forth. So um, we've got ligands for all sorts of different diseases that target these diseases and we are using them to deliver both imaging and therapeutic agents. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. We do have time for one more question. Uh, Dr. Lowe, regarding ligand-targeted therapies, did the studies evaluate the ratio between folate target imaging and neutrophil segmentation? I'm not sure what uh, what the question's about. Um, the um, folate target uh, the the folate targeted images, you know, have varying degrees of tumor to background ratio, or or for or you know um, inflamed lesion to background ratio. It depends on the abundance of the cancer cells or the abundance of the activated macrophages, but. Where they are highly abundant, the tumor to background ratio is very high, and we don't see uptake in neutrophils. I'm not sure what the neutrophil segmentation question is about. Uh, neutrophils do not have a functional folate receptor. Okay, that is all the time we have for questions now. I would just like to ask Dr. Lowe if he has any final comments for our audience. No, I, if you have other questions, you can go ahead and email me, them to me. I, I'll try to answer them, although uh, I get a, over 100 emails a day. And I have a hard time keeping up with them. But uh, certainly, if there are pressing questions, be ha happy to address them. Thank you for your attention. And uh, um, if you have any suggestions for good experiments, I'd love to have them.
Thank you, Dr. Lowe. I would also like to thank our sponsor today, Roche Diagnostics. As a global leader in healthcare, Roche Diagnostics offers a broad portfolio of tools that help healthcare providers in the early detection, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases. In molecular diagnostics, Roche is driven by a vision of working with laboratories like yours to improve the medical value you offer in microbiology, infectious diseases, oncology, and genomics. We continue to meet unmet needs through our investment in research, innovation, and scientific excellence. To learn more, please visit usdiagnostics.roche.com.